Samuel mostly took after his father. He was handsome, and his curly dark hair and deep blue eyes easily attracted girls. He liked to sing, and his incredible voice made street girls melt when they listened to his songs. However, there was only one girl he was interested in. It was Sarah, Isaac, and Jeannie's daughter. He missed her so much. He didn't know where she lived and how to find her. It was a long time ago when he last saw her. Samuel secretly saw Sarah when he was able to sneak from his mother. They spent a wonderful time together. But then, after the government confiscated Isaac's house, Samuel didn't know where to find her. He missed her terribly. Then, on a hot summer day, Samuel was walking down the street and suddenly found her. Walking right toward him. Sarah was 11 years old, but in spite of her young age, she looked very mature and strong. They were very happy to see each other. I looked for you everywhere. Samuel hugged her. Where were you? They threw us out of the house, Sarah replied, crying. I know. Your house looks like a barrack. Yes, I saw it. So, where do you live now? We live in my grandma's house. It's outside the town. Is your father still a police officer? No. When he had a job, he was trying to find a wife or a nanny for us. But it didn't work out. Then, he lost his job and didn't have money for a nanny. When they took our house and threw us into the street, daddy tried to fight them, and I thought they would kill him. It happened so fast that we didn't even have a chance to take a warm blanket for Mayor. He is just two years old. He was so cold, Sarah cried, recalling the events. Now things are not so bad. We live with our grandma. The house is very tiny, just one room, but we live there alone. If we had more than one room, we would probably have neighbors in another room. We have a bed. And we all sleep together. It's nice and cozy to sleep with grandma when she hugs us. She's very old, and usually her feet are cold. So Faga and I warm her up at night. The only problem is that it's too far from your house. It's not my house anymore. You know that. We live with a bunch of rats. I know that. But. You know what I mean. She looked at Samuel and smiled warmly. I missed you so much. I missed you too, Sarah. He embraced her in his arms. I heard about your daddy. I'm so sorry. So, how are you? Sarah asked. Well, mom found a job. She teaches at school now. So, at least we're not starving anymore. That's good. I'm always starving, especially after dad left us. What? Yes. He said that he'd be back soon. He went to the city to find a job, but that was so long ago. He didn't write to us, and didn't send us any money. So Faga, Aaron, and I take care of Mayor. He is so funny and cute. He calls Faga and me, Mommy. Sarah smiled. He's adorable. I wish I had more food to give him. He's so thin and growing up so slowly. I don't understand how could he leave you. Samuel was in shock. Aaron tells us all the time, I wish he was dead. I don't wish him to be dead. But I also need a reason to not hate him so much for leaving us. Mom would never leave us. What about your grandma? She's too old, Samuel. She doesn't eat too much, but she can't work either. She can make a fire and clean the house, but that's about it. Faga and I are trying to find any job, but it's not easy. Also, if we find any food, we feed Mayor first. Are you hungry? Yes. As usual. Wait for me here. Don't move. Samuel ran home and soon came back with bread and sugar. Here. Eat. Sarah took a small piece and hid the rest in her bag. It's for Mayor. Thanks. Would your mother be angry with you for this? Oh, no. What are you talking about? I'll give you more tomorrow. I'll wait for you here. Please come. Since then. Samuel saw Sarah often and never forgot to bring some food for her. He either stole it from his mother or the neighbors or shared his own meal with Sarah. One night, Sarah didn't sleep well. In the morning, when she woke up, 
Her grandmother's hand was heavier and her feet were colder than usual. Sarah was freezing and tired. She tried to get up, but the pressure of her grandmother's arm didn't allow her to move. She slept unusually soundly. Sarah didn't want to wake her up, but was unable to free herself from Granny. Granny, she called, whispering, Granny, it's already morning. I have to get up, Granny. Granny was sleeping. Faga, Sarah called, please help me. I can't wake Granny. She's holding me very tight. Faga came closer, looked at Grandma, and her heart missed a beat. A face of death stared at her. Granny wasn't with them anymore. Faga stood motionless, paralyzed by the shock, looking at their dead grandmother in disbelief. Granny, Sarah called again louder, pushing her grandmother harder. Granny, wake up, please let me go. Faga, please help me. Sarah, Granny's dead. Faga whispered in horror. Then, she climbed on the bed and tried to lift her grandmother's hand, but the body was not flexible. With great difficulty, she helped Sarah free herself from the embrace of the cold body. The boys were still sleeping in the same bed as the girls looked at the corpse in complete silence, not knowing what to do. Suddenly, Faga started to cry. She sat on the floor, covered her face with her hands, and sobbed. Sarah didn't cry. Her mind was blank and her throat was constricted. She wanted to cry, but couldn't. Her body was numb. She looked down at Faga and sat right next to her, hugging her older sister tight. Shish shish, shish shish, she whispered into Faga's ear. That was the way her mother comforted them if they were hurt. When she was alive. Shish shish, shish shish. Then, like thunder, she was struck down with grief, and she screamed. No, Sarah, please don't scream. Faga embraced her sister into her arms. Please, Sarah, don't scream. Shish shish, shish shish. But Sarah kept screaming. Sarah, please. Shish shish, shish shish. Please don't. And Faga sobbed. The boys woke up and looked in shock at their sisters crying on the floor. What happened? Aaron asked, but he didn't get an answer. He looked at his grandmother that was lying right next to him. What happened to Grandma? Why is her hand sticking out in the air like this? She's dead, Aaron, Faga finally said. Mayer crawled closer to his granny and kissed her hand. That was the way his sisters comforted him if he got hurt. Granny, I'm sorry. Here, he kissed her hand again, it doesn't hurt anymore. Does it, Grandma? He was too young to understand what death was. Sarah got up from the floor. Come here, Mayor. Good morning, Mommy. Good morning, sweetheart. It doesn't hurt Granny anymore. She is asleep forever. She will never wake up. She hugged her little brother and cried and cried. The children didn't know what to do with their grandmother's dead body. But they knew that they needed to find food because they were hungry. So, their daily routine began. Mayor, don't go anywhere, okay? Sarah said. We'll try to bring you something to eat. Okay, mommy. I'll be here. I'll sing grandma a lullaby so that she sleeps better. Sarah, Faga, and Aaron left. Sarah and Faga were walking the entire day around town trying to earn some money, but to no avail. In the evening, the food market became deserted and it became the time for orphans to scavenge what they could find. Usually, sellers disposed some vegetables or fruits that had started to rot. And a group of orphans watched them like a flock of greedy, hungry seagulls. As soon as the sellers left, the orphans ran and dug into the waste. Stuffing their mouths with all they could grab from the garbage can. Sarah and Faga walked through the market. They were too late. There was nothing they could eat there. Suddenly, Sarah found a rotten potato under the table. She picked it up, removed the rotten part with her fingers, wiped it with her dress, and put it into her pocket to give to Mayer. When they came home, they found their little brother laying in the bed next to his dead grandmother, playing with her gray hair. He heard the door open, but didn't rush to move from under the blanket. 
Their house smelled terribly. Mayor, what happened here? Sarah asked, trying to understand where this smell came from. Nothing, mommy, he said. Granny is still sleeping. Come here, Mayor. I brought you something. Sarah removed the potato from her pocket and handed it to Mayor. He chewed it greedily. Mommy, did you eat anything today? Yes, Mayor, we did, Faga replied. The door opened and Aaron walked in. What's that smell? He asked with disgust. It's Granny. We have to remove her from the house, Faga said. We have to bury her. How? She is so heavy. We don't have to do it, Aaron said. I've talked to the doctor today. You did what? I was begging for food as usual, and people pushed me away. But then I saw our doctor. So, I ran to him and asked him to give me something to eat. He recognized me, but he didn't give me anything. I told him about our grandma and he said that he would send a casket. He also told me that if we don't find any other food, we can cook turtles and frogs and eat them. Eat frogs. Faga screamed. Yes. He said that people eat them, so I went to a pond and caught five frogs. He removed frogs from his pocket and placed them on a table. I just don't know how to cook them. The children heard steps outside, and the door opened. The doctor came in, and a couple more people followed him. Hello children, he said. We're going to take your dead grandmother away. Several men lifted the dead body and carried it outside. So, Aaron, did you catch any turtles or frogs in the pond today? The doctor asked. Yes. Great. Now, you have to make a fire and cook them. How do we cook them? Faga asked. Oh, you can put them in boiling water, or if it's a frog, you can pierce it through with a stick. Hold it over an open fire for some time, and then just eat it. I never tasted it, but I know that in other countries. People think it's delicious. The children hoped that the doctor would give them something to eat, but instead he said, well, I guess you're good now. Have a good night. Then, he left. By word of mouth, the neighbors found out very quickly about the grandmother's death. These kids will die soon too. One neighbor spoke to another. Yes, there is no way they can survive. I know. Four children alone. Also, what can we expect from the children of a policeman and an ex-convict? They are poor children. Oh well. God sits there and watches us. He knows better. Everything has a reason. God is simply cleaning up the mess that all the bad people made. So, if they die, they die by God's will. Yay, poor children. A few neighbors came to the orphans. Some out of curiosity, while others came to bring some food. Although none of them forgot to take something in exchange from the house, the children didn't have much, and soon, they found themselves in an empty house. There were only foreign books still standing in straight rows on the bookshelves. These books, along with some other papers that Red Army soldiers were not able to read, were thrown away from the house onto a garbage pile. So Isaac would pick them up at night and bring them to his mother's house. It was already late at night when a huge neighbor came storming into the house. Ignoring the children, he looked around. The bookshelf caught his attention. He had no interest in foreign books but thought that the bookshelf might be useful. He grabbed it with his hands, trying to detach it from the wall. But it was nailed firmly. He was disappointed. There was nothing he could take. Then, he took a quick look at the children and noticed that eight-year-old Aaron was wearing his father's jersey. Hmm, I could use that, he said, and forcefully took it off the boy. Aaron faithfully stood there and cried, letting the big guy rob him. Please, don't take it from me, Aaron sobbed. You're going to die anyway, the man said and headed to the front door. Faga ran after him, grabbing his shirt and angrily yelling. He turned around and punched her in the face with his fist, you dirty kike, get off me, and slammed the door behind him. Faga sat on the floor, wiping her bloody and teary face. Her frightened siblings surrounded her. 
Mommy, don't cry. Mayer hugged her with his small hands. I love you, Mommy. He was too small, but he understood what happened. Mommy, are we going to die? No, Mayer, Sarah replied. We are not going to die. We are going to live a long life, and one day we'll be happy again. I promise you. Faga hugged her sister. And they both cried and cried. Sarah and Faga continued to walk through the town looking for any source of income they could find. They weren't lucky that day and, hoping for some help, came to the place where Sarah usually met Samuel, but he wasn't there. Samuel hadn't seen Sarah for more than a week already. He was lucky these days because he found a job and had to go there much earlier in the morning and leave late at night. He had no idea what had happened to her. The girls waited a long time, and then, being desperate, headed to Riva's house. It was already dark outside when they knocked on the Riva's door. Rivka, a neighbor called. There are some orphans asking for you. She opened the door. Sarah and Faga stood in front of her. They had grown since the last time she saw them. The girls were thin and pale. Even though Faga was older, she looked weaker than Sarah and bore Jeannie's resemblance. She had inherited her father's eyes, though, and so had Sarah. Aunt Riva. We're looking for Samuel, Sarah said. Do you know where he is? I don't. And what are you two doing here this late? Samuel promised to bring us some food. We didn't eat anything today. And Aaron and Mayer are starving too. Samuel promised to bring you food? Riva was outraged. Where did he get it? Sarah suddenly realized that Samuel had lied to her. She was looking at Riva in silence, hoping for mercy. Riva looked at the girls in disbelief. Where is your father? And what happened to your face, Faga? Daddy doesn't live with us anymore. He left us long ago, and Grandma died a day before yesterday, Sarah replied. Our neighbor stole Aaron's jacket. I yelled at him, so he hit me in my face, Faga added. Riva was shocked. There was nothing sadder than when the children were deprived of their parents' care. But she didn't want to know any more details about them. She just wanted them to go away. Their resemblance to Isaac irritated her. Riva couldn't stand it. While she talked to the girls, their father's shadow was present and a new wave of anger and hate filled Riva's heart. She remembered how she confessed to Isaac, hoping for some help and how he'd walked away. Not only that, but he was also in a much better situation than Riva was now. She couldn't help his children anyway. Wait here, she said, and rushed to her room. She returned with some bread and gave it to Sarah. That's all I have. Don't come back to me. I have no more, Riva warned. The door closed behind the girl's back. Riva returned to her room and threw herself on the bed, sobbing heavily. What choice did she have? Shame and hate gnawed at her terribly. Do I have to run after them, stop them, and give them more? She didn't have more. Do I have to invite them in and share with them my room? She didn't have extra place to share. Do I have to tell them to come back again? What for? She had nothing to offer. What about my children, and my life? Who cares about me? No one. Do I have to become a mother of Jeannie's children? Could I? Must I? There were too many orphans roaming the streets. Their life turned out to be so cruel and unfair. Jeannie never listened to me. Ever. Riva's heart ached. How many times I told her not to get involved into this secret revolutionary group. She ignored my advice, and was convicted. Riva sobbed. And then, who helped her to find a job? Riva did. I risked my reputation, but I helped her, regardless. Didn't I tell her to wash and clean during the typhus epidemic? Didn't I? She did. I did. Did she listen? No. Not only had she ignored my advice again, she also thought I was an idiot. Riva wiped tears from her face. Now she's dead, and I have to deal with her fugitive husband and orphan children. Is it my duty to take care of them? Now I have to live with shame for the rest of my life, because of her faults. 
I didn't abandon her children, Isaac did. How could he? How would I live with this shame? She was screaming inside, but it didn't matter anymore. She'd made her choice. Faga and Sarah would never forgive her for as long as they both lived. Reva blamed Samuel for stealing food from his brother and sisters, but he ignored her. His heart belonged to Sarah and he was ready to do anything to help her and to be with her. Reva and her children didn't starve, but they had just enough to survive because she had a job. However, she hated her life, and there was nothing she could do to change it. To survive. She did her best in the face of failing and losing it. Reva watched the new generation grow up being taught the communist ideas and rules. And she was one of those teachers who taught youngsters those ideas, even though they were against her nature. She hated those youngsters. Her own children were not much different to everybody else. They lived their lives being involved in the communist regime, as well as its traditions and ideas. The more they grew up, the more distant and withdrawn they became from their mother. At first, Riva hoped that her life would return to the old lifestyle, but years passed and nothing changed. She was never happy, and nobody ever saw her smile. There were a lot of hateful, arrogant, and ignorant people in the world, and the orphans suffered from their cruelty. However, there were other people who helped the children to survive. They offered Faga and Sarah different jobs, and the girls were always ready for any opportunity. They cleaned houses, worked in kitchens of different eateries, and babysat small children. A neighbor shoemaker taught Aaron how to repair shoes, while the boy also brought food home for his little brother and sisters. No matter how hard they tried, they made very little money. To survive, they caught turtles in a nearby river, took off their shells, and ate them raw. The children didn't have firewood to make a fire to cook them. Fall arrived, and the children started coming to the fields after the harvest to pick up leftover sunflower and wheat seeds, though there wasn't that much to gather. The weather grew colder every day, and then it started to snow. They had only one pair of boots that belonged to their grandmother, so they had to share them to go outside. Therefore, only one of them could wrap their feet into cloth bags, shove them into the boots, and go into the field to dig some seeds or find wooden sticks for a fire. The others stayed home, waiting. The children were always starving, so they tried to sleep more to get rid of that horrible feeling. If they happened to be lucky enough to get more than enough food to satisfy their hunger, they wouldn't eat it all and would save some for a rainy day. When winter came, the children ran out of wood quickly. To keep warm, they cuddled each other, as they usually did when their grandma was alive. When it was extremely cold, they burned the books. Mayer suffered the most. Mommy, wrap me up. I'm cold, he would say to Sarah or Faga and the girls would then wrap their little brother in towels. Mayer was an adorable little kid, and the older children loved him dearly. All the books were burned. Aaron chipped a piece of wood and searched for some paper. Faga, can I use this paper to make a fire? No, you can't, she said. Mommy told me that these are documents from Palestine and they say that she owns a house and land there. Why do we need them anyway, Faga? What is Palestine? Mommy's not with us anymore. We need to make a fire, and there's no other paper here. We'll freeze to death. This is just a story. If there is a God, he would help us anyway. He didn't receive any answer. The papers easily caught fire. The proof of private property ownership, which was worth a fortune, burned, creating sparks that briefly reflected in the children's eyes and warming their small, cold, and hungry bodies. Those children were the possessors of the most expensive land in Palestine, yet they were the coldest, most miserable, and starving children in the entire world. The children lay down on their mattress and Faga told them a story about the beautiful warm country of Palestine. Her mother told her a story a long time ago, and it seemed like a tale. She painted a picture of Jerusalem in her siblings' imagination. 
The city shined like gold when the sun rose. The cold, gray room turned into a sunny, green garden filled with juicy grapes and fruits. The children imagined as God flew toward them on a bright pink cloud covered with beautiful flowers from the glimmering sky. God came closer. No, it was not God. It was their mother. She gave them fresh bread and warm milk as a joyful melody filled the air. Then, she took them to a big, beautiful, and warm house where they prayed for the food they had and the life they lived. Faga, when I grow up, I'll be a pilot, Aaron said, closing his eyes. And then I'll fly us all to mommy. Finally, the children were asleep. Faga closed her eyes, thinking about her mother. Oh. She missed her mother singing good night so very much. She was a wonderful storyteller, and all those stories about their native land remained like a dream that would never going to come true. Faga didn't believe a single word she just told her little brothers. We have no chance of surviving this winter, she thought, and was about to cry, but was too tired and simply fell asleep. The children lay on their mattress, cuddling each other to keep warm as somebody knocked on the door. Faga got up and opened the door. A young woman stood there smiling warmly. She wore a gray hat with a five-point red star fused on it. Hey, guys. May I come in? Sure. Faga was surprised. She forgot the last time people spoke to her this friendly. My name is Olga. I'm here to help you. Do you want to come with me? I'll take you to a warmer place where you could eat something. The communist government gathered orphans all around the country into orphanages. They kept siblings together. Therefore, Sarah, Faga, Aaron, and Mayer found themselves in the same orphanage in Kharkov City, far away from Israelovka. It seemed that all their sufferings were over. But the children didn't feel much better there. They soon learned that the counselors stole everything from the orphans. Food, clothing, wood, and medication. All the children starved, got sick, and dropped dead like flies. There was nobody who could stand up for them. To survive, the children robbed each other and the youngest suffered the most. Mayer never got anything to eat in the kitchen. He handed his plate to a counselor and received it back filled with salty water that she called soup. He looked at his plate, not moving. Next, the counselor yelled, and Mayer was pushed over. The next kid was much older. He received the same kind of soup, but there was some potato in it as well. Can I have more? Mayer asked as he raised his tear-filled eyes. Next, the counselor yelled. Mayer looked at Sarah, Mommy. She didn't give me anything to eat, he cried sadly. You didn't give him anything. Sarah shouted in desperation. I did. The counselor angrily confronted her. You're lying. He just ate everything. Instead of being thankful that you're not dead already, you open your dirty mouth. How typical of a kike. Next, Sarah, Faga, and Aaron shared their food with Mayer. Food was the major concern for all the orphans, and they never rested, looking for any chance to get more. One night, Aaron sneaked from the bedroom into the kitchen, hoping to find leftovers or something edible in the garbage can. When he opened the kitchen door, he realized that he wasn't alone. Three other boys of the same age were searching the kitchen cabinets. They noticed a newcomer and didn't know how to react. Aaron was afraid that they would beat him up. But then he realized that the other boys were just as scared as he was. Hi, he greeted them. I'm not going to tell anybody that I saw you here. The boys didn't move. I have a little brother. He never gets anything to eat. I don't want him to die, so I give him my food. But I need to eat too. You know, he waited for them to respond. You've got to be kidding me. One of the boys loosened up finally. Hmm. You need to eat too. I wish I'd get a penny every time I hear this. I'd be a millionaire already. He smirked. I'm Isa. Our sister is sick. Mom always says to eat more if you're sick, but there is nothing here anyway. Do you have a mother? Aaron was surprised. I thought that the orphanage was for orphans only. 
he started to search through the cabinets, hoping to find something that these three brothers might have missed. Our parents have no job. So they sent us here for a while. Well, that's good that you have parents. My mom died, and my father left us. I hate him. What's taking you so long? A little girl with short, black, curly hair and a pair of blackberry eyes on her pale face came into the kitchen, closing the door behind her. Anna, you'd better go back to your bed, the older brother, Leo, told her. You can't walk around being sick. You were gone for too long. I was worried. The counselors could still come, and if they find out, you'll be in trouble, she replied. So what? Issa said. I don't care. They don't feed us anyway. Anna spotted Aaron. Hi. What's your name? I'm Aaron. Aaron. Are you looking for food for your sister too? No. I'm looking for food for my little brother, but there's nothing here. Is he sick? No, he's just very hungry. Are you sick? Yes, and I'm cold too. My mom tells me that I'm too thin. Which is why I'm cold. I would give you my jacket, if I had one. My neighbor stole it from me. It was very warm. Stole? Did you see it? Yes, he took it off me. My sister fought him. And he beat her up. Oh, I'm sorry, Aaron. If we hug each other, we'll get warmer. Do you know that? Anna asked. Yes. We always hug each other. Anna gave Aaron a bright smile. It's very generous of you to think of sharing your jacket with me. We have to tell our parents about all this, the smaller brother, Jacob, said. You've got to be kidding me. How would it help? Issa was irritated. What can they do about it? We have to do something for ourselves, a girl's firm voice sounded out in the dark. The children then turned and saw Sarah standing by the door. We're all starving, sick, and dying. These counselors are thieves. They belong in prison. The children looked at Sarah in silence. They needed some leadership, and here it was. We were starving when we were alone. Now. We're beaten by bigger children, humiliated, and still starving. So, what do we have to do? Who do we have to tell? Issa asked. These committee guys are the same, Leo said in distress. Yes. I saw it myself. My counselor gave them a pack of meat from the kitchen, Jacob confirmed. There is no reason to even try, Leo concluded, but Sarah had her mother Jeannie's revolutionary spirit. So she would not give up that easy. If we come together and cover for each other, we might be able to do something about it. What can we do? Leo resisted. Instead of fighting and stealing food from each other, we have to unite and fight our counselors. Look how many people we have here an entire army. And how many counselors do we have? Five or six? They're just humans. My mother taught me that all people are just humans. We have to fight them, not our little brothers and sisters. So, you're saying that we have to tie them up and put them in prison? Ha? Huh? Well, yes. You've got to be kidding me. Issa smirked. I know where the communist committee is. We've been there before they brought us here. We can go there, find Olga, and tell her everything. Who is Olga? Leo asked. I don't know any Olga. She's the woman who brought us here. And I trust her. Why do you think she is any different to all these counselors? Because she shared her food with me and didn't start eating it until she was sure that I had enough. Sarah. What if she's not in the committee anymore? Aaron asked. We don't know, and we'll never know if we don't try, Sarah replied angrily. If we don't find her, we'll talk to someone in the committee openly anyway. If we don't speak up, nobody will know, and we'll all die. In any case, we won't lose anything. These counselors condemned us to death already. Don't you understand? The children were so desperate that they were ready for this challenge. The news about a secret children's group spread very quickly. And the counselors found out about it as well. At night, in complete silence and darkness, a heavy hand covered Sarah's mouth and she was pulled from her bed, as if in a terrifying nightmare. 
Someone put a bag over her head and dragged her somewhere. She was a strong and brave girl and didn't give up that easy, but she couldn't overcome several adults. She was pushed onto the concrete floor. You might sit here for a couple of days and think about your rights. Sarah recognized one of the counselor's voices. The next thing she heard was the heavy sound of a door slamming and locking from the other side, followed by the movement of furniture. Sarah was alone. She removed the bag from her head and found herself locked in an empty basement closet without any windows. The closet was pitch dark. The cement walls and floor were cold and moist. There was nothing to sit or lay on. She stood there for some time, and it was tiring. Don't sit or lean on a rock, it will take your life away, her grandmother had told her many times. So, she didn't. But as time went by, the exhaustion brought her down. Sarah put the bag that she removed from her head on the floor, sat on it, and then lay down. And then, she had no strength to get up. The floor was cold, and the bag she was laying on didn't protect her from cold and moisture. She felt how the cement floor was pulling the life out of her, exactly as her grandma warned her. Sarah lay there for eternity, with no idea how many hours or days had passed. She was thirsty because nobody brought her water, she was starving because nobody brought her food. In complete darkness, she touched the moist walls, attempting to find a way to escape. Sarah felt drops of water on her palms and licked them. She touched the wall again and licked her palms again, and again, and again. But she was still thirsty. Sarah found the bag on the floor again and sat on it. She remembered Faga and her touch. She closed her eyes, wrapped her hands around her shoulder, and cried. It didn't matter anymore. Why should she open her eyes anyway if she couldn't see? She was cold and tired. She didn't feel hunger anymore. She didn't care. She just fell asleep. Sarah didn't know who took her from the basement, but when she regained consciousness, she found herself in a hospital room. It was a big room with about 40 people in it. She lifted her head from the pillow and a nurse moved from one patient to another, in between hospital beds. You're a very brave girl. Do you know that? She said, coming closer to Sarah. Sarah smiled weakly. Your sister asked me to tell you that she'll visit you tonight. Where am I? Sarah asked. You're in the hospital. You were very cold and severely dehydrated, and to tell you the truth, you're the lucky one. People usually die with your condition. So you are my hero. Faga came to the hospital when it was already dark outside. She hugged Sarah tight for a long time, crying. I thought you died, when I first saw you. What happened? Faga? When they grabbed you, I wasn't sleeping. I saw who did it. I was afraid to follow them because they would put me into the basement too. So, while they were busy with you, I woke up the boys and we ran away. In the morning, we went to the committee. I was looking for Olga, but she wasn't there. Nobody wanted to listen to me. They thought that Mayer was my son because he calls me, Mommy. They thought that I wanted to give him up for adoption. When I told them what happened, they didn't believe me. They accused me of making up stories. We couldn't go back because we knew that they'd do the same to us as they did to you. So, we just sat on the stairs outside and didn't leave. We begged for food the entire day. It was very cold at night, but Mayer didn't complain. I was so afraid for him. A teardrop fell down her cheek. I couldn't sleep at night because I was too scared. But Aaron and Mayer slept. I fell asleep only at sunrise, and then, I was awakened by a woman's voice. Why are these homeless kids sitting there when they belong in an orphanage? I opened my eyes and saw Olga. And she recognized me. I was so happy to see her. I knew that we were safe. After telling everything, she took us in and gave us food, and it was so warm there. We told her how babies die because they starved and how nobody cares when they're sick. We also spoke about how the counselors would steal everything and that we have no food, clothes, or bedding. 
We told her that they grabbed you last night and took you some place. Olga took a couple of gunmen with us, and we came back to the orphanage. We couldn't find you. We didn't know where they took you nobody knew. The door to the closet was camouflaged. Once all the counselors were arrested, they were interrogated for two days, while you were in the basement with no water or food. So finally, one gunman said to them, If you don't tell us where you hid the girl, I'll kill you all one by one. But they still refused to tell, so then he shot Mrs. Frog in the knee. Then, she cried out loud and confessed. And we found you. I thought you were dead. Then, they said that you were alive, and I prayed. Faga cried again. It's over now. Thank you. Sarah reached over to her sister. You are my hero. Sarah. She smiled. So, what's going to happen now? Are they going to bring new counselors to us, hopefully good ones? No. They said that we would take care of everything. We'll receive food and clothes and everything else to equally distribute them between us. Olga said that we could take care of ourselves without anyone's help. I like that. Sarah smiled. So, maybe this new communism idea is not that bad after all. What do you think? I think it's good, but it was better when we lived with mommy. I miss her so much. I miss her too. The sisters hugged each other. You know what, Sarah? Olga found me a job. What? Sarah got excited. Yes. She said that since I'm almost 15 years old. I can start working. She said that I'm very responsible. The only problem is that if I start working, I have to move out of the orphanage. That means that I won't see you every night anymore. Though, I promise you that as soon as I make money, I'll take you to live with me. Okay? No, Sarah said. We have food here. You won't be able to feed all three of us on your salary. I guess that, if you have more than you need, you'll share it with us, and if we have more than we need, we'll share it with you. In a year, when I turn 15, I'll ask Olga to find me a job, too. Together. It would be much easier. Yes. I guess you're right, Faga agreed. How are Aaron and Mayer? They're good. Aaron's new friend, Anna, helps him out with Mayer, though he's already a big boy. They spend a lot of time together. Faga smiled. It's better than fighting each other, Sarah said in agreement. Sarah, I have something to give you. Guess what? I can't. Samuel wrote you a letter. He wants to come visit you. He doesn't know anything about you. I think he loves you, Sarah. Letter? You read my letter? Yep. What? You weren't there and I thought it might be something important. Faga pulled the letter from her packet. Well, if you weren't sick, I would make you dance for me. Give it to me. Now. Sarah laughed. She opened the letter and silently read it, wearing a happy face. Then, a shadow covered her cheeks. I'll never forgive his mother for showing us the door. She told us that she had no more. Maybe she didn't. Sarah, it doesn't matter and it's not important. The important thing is that he loves you. I love him too, Faga, Sarah smiled. Sarah returned to the orphanage as a hero. The children greeted her with delight because their life had improved, thanks to her. Their faces had changed. They looked happier and healthier. A new director was assigned to the orphanage. She seemed like a nice lady. However, the children didn't want to take any more chances and kept the responsibility of the food distribution to themselves. Faga left the orphanage. It was difficult to live without her, though Sarah was happy for her. Sarah was stronger and healthier than all the other children. The director of the orphanage used her when she needed help, and Sarah became the most useful employee, and she was free of charge. However, when Sarah turned 15, the director told her that she had to leave the orphanage. You are too old to stay here. I have to follow the regulations, Sarah. I have no place to go. Sarah begged the director. I can't live in my sister's dorm, they won't allow it. Please, let me stay. You know that I can do any job you want. Sarah, I don't have an open position for you. I'll work for food only. 
until I find a job. Please. But I can't let you sleep with other children, Sarah. I can sleep at any place. Please. Just let me stay. Sarah was given a place in a closet where she could sleep on a mattress, and she was happy. It was nicer to sleep on a bed than in a closet, but she didn't have to be on the street. Begging for food and becoming a prostitute like a lot of girls her age and in her predicament. Faga visited her siblings every Sunday, bringing them food and stories. Sarah, Aaron, and Mayer loved to listen to her. She was a very good storyteller and reminded them of their mother. Faga told them about the factory she worked at, the dorm she lived in, the people she met, and her new life. Faga worked six days a week and ten hours a day. In the evening, she spent time with the other teenagers that lived in the dorm. It was a difficult life, but at least it was fun. One day, feeling extremely happy, Faga visited her siblings. Her eyes were shining, and a smile beamed on her face. I met a guy, she said, avoiding making eye contact with her sister and brothers. Shy as she was. Really? Sarah was delighted. Tell me more. His name is David, she said gladly. He is not local. I mean, his parents live in Kharkiv. But he lives in Leningrad with his brother Lev. Oh, my God. He has a brother. Yes. Is he cute? I don't know. I never saw him. Faga giggled. Okay, okay, David. It's a good name. Yes. I dream his name. David. So, tell me more. He lives with his brother in Leningrad and is going to college there. He is going to be a shipbuilder engineer. Wow. It's so romantic. Where did you meet him? I have a co-worker, Zena. I don't like her very much because she is too bossy. But that doesn't matter she likes me. She is married and pregnant. Her husband, Joseph, has two brothers, and both of them are single. She said that one of his brothers, Lev, is dating her sister, and another one, David, doesn't have a girlfriend. So, she invited me to her house. And I came. She introduced me to David. Faga caught her breath. Go on. Don't rush me. I'm telling you the story. Okay. Okay. So, at first, he didn't even want to look at my directions. Why? You are good looking. I don't know why. It seemed like he didn't like Zena, and since I was her friend, he didn't like me by default. But then, I caught him staring at me. Oh my god. Yes. My face was burning. Faga shined. And? Sarah was insistent. And, what? Oh. Come on. Tell me everything. It happened so unexpectedly, Sarah. What? What? Did he kiss you? Yes. Faga whispered. Oh. My god. He kissed you. When? How? And then what? He walked me to my dorm. And then he kissed my lips. I got so scared that I ran away. You shouldn't. I know. But I couldn't stay. Okay. So, what happened then? Just keep talking. I hate when I have to pull the words out of your mouth. The next day, Zena told me that he liked me very much and wanted to see me again, so I agreed. Did you see him again? Not yet. I'll see him again tonight. Oh, at this rate, I'll only know all the details in a week. I can't wait that long. You have to come sooner and tell me everything. Sarah laughed. You know. I can't. Aaron and Mayer listened to their older sisters and held their breath. They had never seen them this happy. In a week, Faga came back to the orphanage with more stories. Sarah demanded all the details, and Faga complied with pleasure, as her younger brothers listened to every word, not blinking. Zena told me that David wanted to see me at seven, in the park. So I came. He was not there, and at first I thought that she mocked me. She was the kind of girl that could. I was not sure and was very nervous. I looked around and didn't see him coming. So, in a few minutes, as I was about to leave, suddenly, warm hands covered my eyes from behind, and David said, guess who? Oh, it's so romantic. Sarah sighed. I know. Faga giggled. Then, he said he had thought about inviting me to a movie, 
but then changed his mind because he had to leave in a few days. No. Yes. So, we were circling the park for a few hours, talking and kissing, no no no. Tell me all the details. Tell me about the very first kiss. I already told you the last time. Faga laughed. No. Sarah protested. That was the very first kiss. And I want to know about the first kiss after that very first kiss. Okay. As we walked in a park, he told me about his life. I kind of listened to what he was saying. But I also felt that the kiss was coming, so I couldn't concentrate on his story very much. I was trembling from the top of my head to the tip of my toes, thinking about the kiss. Oh. My God. He told me that he lived with his brother, Lev, in Leningrad. Lev worked to provide for both of them, and David studied. He said that after he graduated from college, he'd work and Lev would study. What? Sarah shouted. You'll be an old maid if you wait for both of them. No way. She concluded with disappointment. Wait. Let me tell you the whole story. Okay. So, then he said, I thought it was a good plan, until I met you. And I asked him, why? And then he stopped walking and turned to face me. He looked into my eyes, and at that point, I knew the kiss was coming. David put one hand around my shoulder and another one on the back of my head and said, Because I can't imagine living without you for this long. And then he bent down and kissed me on my lips the first time. Oh. Sarah sighed with admiration. I hope you didn't run away this time. No, I didn't, Faga giggled. It was not that hard to stay this time. Good. Did you kiss him back? Sarah jumped on her seat. Yes. I put my hands around his neck, and he pulled me closer. My heart was pounding so intensely that I was afraid that he would feel it. But then, I felt the warmth of his body. And somehow I was not nervous anymore, but I just wished that moment would last forever. I'm so happy for you, sis. Sarah sighed. Thanks. Also, do you remember I told you that his brother, Lev, dates Zena's sister? Yes. Why? She was bluffing. She wanted Lev to date her sister. But David said, it's enough to have one Zena in our family. He said that the reason he didn't want to talk to me at first was that Zena brought me in. He said that nobody liked her. So. Lev is single. That's great, but he lives too far away. Well, as mom told us, if there's a will, then there's a way. David said that Lev would come to visit his parents soon. It's a good plan. I guess. But I don't know if I want to do it. I'm already tired of waiting for letters from Samuel. Do you want me to exchange letters with one more guy? Why not? Sarah. You wanted him. No. I was just kidding. I want Samuel. I miss him. You told me that I have to regard all opportunities, but when it comes to you, you don't want to do it. All right, all right. Whatever, Sarah answered with annoyance.